Thanks for coming, everybody. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. As, uh, just to make sure everyone's in the right spot, like the MC mentioned, this is nature, wildlife photography. And I'm up from L.A. This is actually my second time here. Anybody see me? Did anybody see my last show here about a year ago? Oh, good. Good to see people again. So, so today, sorry. So my goal today is to try and inspire you, but not only just to talk about my, my pictures, but also I'm going to give you all my secrets and all the techniques that have helped me over the years uh, get pretty good at making uh, wildlife photos. And I'll share all my, all my professional secrets, and I'll give you the specs on everything, and I'll try and talk to you about what my motivation was and what my idea was behind a lot of the images. And being a nature photographer, wildlife photographer professionally means I get to go a lot of nice places and see a lot of nice, a lot of nice natural history. And I also take people, so I do guiding, do wildlife tours also. I do uh, some eagle photography tours, bear tours. And one of the things I'm always looking for in the pictures is some kind of interaction, some kind of story in the picture. And it's interesting when you spend a lot of time up there, you get to really uh, know, know the animals pretty well. You know, in a lot of cases, the, uh, the bear's relationships between the mother and the cub really change. But normally, one of the things we're after is just getting interaction between the members of the family. So we're trying to get interaction between the mother and the cub. It makes it really interesting. Rather than just a portrait, we're trying to get some kind of, some kind of story. But if you'll notice in, mo in all the pictures, if you notice, I'm always looking to try and get eye contact. And one of the ways I do that is I'll, we'll talk about this in another, in another few slides, but I'll try and uh, go down to the eye level. So I'll try and get low to the level of the subject. It really helps. It really helps. The image will have more impact. It's more intimate when you get down lower. we got a lot of pictures to go through today. And this is interesting. So normally I get a lot of questions, and probably the main question is, isn't it dangerous when you go up shooting bears? And it actually really isn't if you know you have a good guide and you have experience. And the bears don't have a, a developed verbal communication skill, but they give you lots of clues to what they're doing and what their, what their disposition is and what they're feeling. But the ones you really need to worry about are the younger bears. This is a, like a juvenile bear. And they're not so aware of themselves and humans, especially as the older bears are. So this guy comes cruising up the river in the grass. And we're actually on a gravel bar shooting bears catching salmon. And this guy comes over, over through the grass and just freezes and looks up at us completely just shocked that there's humans there. Didn't smell us. We're downwind, whatever. And just sat there for a minute. And how I shoot is I have a, a main lens, a 500, and then I have a shorter zoom on a belt, on a, uh, sorry, on a belt, in a, in a spider holster. And I was able to bring the shorter lens up and, and shoot a few pictures off. That's full frame. I didn't crop it. Um, one of the nice things about zoom lenses are they usually typically have a closer focus distance than the long lenses, like a 500. And there's no way I could have made that picture with a 500. My 500 close focus distance is about, I think it's like eight feet. The 50 to 500, which is what I used to make this picture, the close focus, I can shoot my toes. So it's a much closer fo fo close focus distance. And usually when we do the bear trips, that's, that's the peak of action is when the bears are fishing for salmon. You get, uh, sometimes we'll have up to 20 bears at one time around us. And there's just thousands and thousands of fish going up the river. It's really, really exciting. I mean, I've been going up there since 2007, and I still can't believe how much fun it is and how exciting it is. Really interesting, very, very interesting. Just all around you are just awesome, awesome opportunities for photography. Now, <clears throat> the first thing we'll discuss is how I meter. And I like to shoot in manual. It's really important, especially in conditions like this, where you have a dark subject, bright water, and a middle tone background. If you're in an auto mode, what happens is, is the meter is using the light that's reflecting off the background to set. 
which actually is wrong. A lot of times what will happen is it will see the dark bear. It will open up too much. So what happens? Things start to blow out. So you're going to get the fish is going to completely blow out. The water is going to blow out. So what I do is I'll actually meter up into the green, put it in manual mode, meter up into the green, fill the meter with green, which is a middle tone, and I'll set my shutter speed, in this case about 1,200th of a second, 1250 of a second, and I'll set my aperture, which is usually 5, 6, f8, whatever. And this is the trick. This is the tricky part I was going to tell you about. This is my secret. What I'll do is I won't change those. What I'll do is I'll just hit my ISO button, and I'll use the ISO to set my exposure. It works very, 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 very well. So the reason I want to do that is I want a certain shutter speed to stop action, and I really like a certain f-stop. So I'd rather vary my ISO. Especially on the newer cameras, it really works really well. I've been doing it for a couple of years. You try it. I mentioned earlier about your positioning when you shoot the photos, and this is what this is about. Very important. So you always want to get down to the eye level of the subject, whether it's your pet dog or bear, whatever. It really helps looking directly at head on and get good eye contact. Not only that, but one of the, one of the tricks professionals use is, there's ton, a lot of tricks people don't usually share a lot of time, in a lot of cases, is one of the ways you make a real strong photo with impact is you get it to, to pop out of the background, like almost like a three-dimensional effect. And one of the tricks to doing that is, is getting low. So here you see two bears. They're actually playing. They're not fighting. They're playing around. And I'm at tripod level, so I'm up high. Same place, like 20 minutes later, I'm down low, sitting on the ground. That's just almost exactly the same. You can see the background's actually the same. So what a big difference in photos. I actually like both of them, but I think this is stronger because it almost has like a 3D effect. What happens is when you're shooting at eye level, the, de the angle of declination is such that your depth of field extends farther back. So more of the background's in focus. But when you're down low, parallel to the ground, the background's completely washed out. And most people, especially beginners, think, well, you must have had a 1.8 or a 1.4 or 2.8 lens. Well, no, actually, that's like an f8 or 5.6. It's not the f-stop that does that. It's the distance to the background. OK, so try that. And get low in your photos. It really helps. It works awesome with birds. This is the lace and albatross running. We're lay, the group's laying in the sand. The birds are running around us. Um, after about five minutes after this photo was taken, after me telling the group to keep low, keep low, one of the guys actually, I think either stood up or went on his knees, and a bird, bird just, bam, <laughs> hit. The bird got knocked out for a minute and got back up. He was OK. But the nice thing about these birds is they have a 10-foot wingspan, so they have to run really, really far to get enough speed. Giant long runway. Really, really funny. It's the same case here with the background. I was down really low and got a real nice soft background. Angle of view, like we discussed, is really important also for macro. So this is the typical picture people would make when they walk up and they see a a frog, they would just shoot down. That's probably what everyone here would do. Just, oh, a frog, look at that, shoot right down. But if you adjust your position and get down lower, the photo completely changes. So now I'm stooped over, but I don't like stooping over my back will start hurting. So now I got lower. So now I think I'm on my knees, and now I'm the lowest. I think actually that's the much stronger than just looking down at it. So try that. Uh, Sigma was mentioned that Sigma sponsored this show. They're, they're a really good company to work for. Um, I don't have to talk about them. I don't have to tell you what great lenses they are, which they are. But it's really nice. They actually sponsor me to come and try and motivate you and maybe inspire you to get out in nature and do some wildlife photography. And if you can, there's, they have a booth here if you want to go see some of their lenses. This was a 50 to 500 zoom, one of my favorite lenses. And the funny story that I was uh, working for them as for a contract on a contract, I was selling them images and doing some promotion for them. And they tried to get me to try some of their longer lenses. And I, I shoot Nikon body. I also have Nikon lenses. And they tried to get me to do it. And I just didn't really want it. wasn't really interested. So finally, I'm on this trip up in Alaska for a month shooting eagles. And they asked, can they send me? Can they FedEx me a lens? I said, sure, go ahead. So they FedExed it up. And the week went on. Then the next week went on. I still didn't try the lens. Never tried, never tried a Sigma long lens before. And then the end of the trip's coming up, and it was almost the last day. And I said, you know, I really owe it to these guys to try this lens. I haven't even shot a picture with it. So I went outdoors, shot a few pictures. Hey, look sharp. I'll take it out. Next day, I took it out. I still didn't use it. 
So then the last day I said, you know, I really got to take it out. I'm going to leave my Nikon lenses in the hotel and I'm going to take just the Sigma stuff. So first time out, I got a keeper. I mean, that's pretty incredible. How many people do bird photography? Anybody? A couple? Well, you probably know then, you notice I didn't cut the feather tip. Usually, the chances are that if you get a really, really good photo of a bird in flight, chances are the better it is, the more chance you cut the feather tip off. And I didn't cut the feather tip. That's because I was using a zoom. That's one of the advantages of a zoom over a prime lens. You're able to, to size the bird in the frame. I got another keeper the same day. Pretty special. And this is years ago. So since then, the 50 to 500 has become one of my favorite lenses. I love it. Take it on vacation. Take it different places. It just really comes in handy being able to shoot a wide, almost like a scenic picture, and then being able to go in very, very tight, especially for eagles. For eagles, I'm able to shoot them up close, and I'm able to shoot them up in the back when they'll bank across the mountains. Really, really, really a powerful lens. And it's really good value also for the money. I'll never forget this picture. So I'm in Alaska. I'm on a bear, uh, excuse me, an eagle tour. I'm in there for almost a month shooting eagles every single day. And I remember, that, I'll never forget this picture. So I'm following this eagle in the viewfinder. And I'm, we have a special boat that I charter that has a drop front. So the, it's like a landing craft. So the front goes, tunk, and we put, the, we put this, this door on, on the water. So it's flat on the water. And we go out and we lay on the door. So we're basically a couple inches above the water when we're shooting. And I'm following this eagle for the viewfinder, and he's coming in like a rocket. And I'm saying, wow, amazing, get a good picture. And I'm zooming in. And by the way, to show you how close I was, that's made at 90 millimeter, uncropped. So it was probably to that laptop, because an eagle's really large, probably the laptop. And he's flying full speed. And I remember in the viewfinder seeing this eagle fill in the frame, and I'm going, wow, it's amazing. And all of a sudden, I remember feeling something brush against the lens. And all of a sudden, something hits me in the head. You know, whack. And then when I look over, I see this brown blur go, and it hits the boat and bounces off the boat. Turns out, there was an eagle behind him chasing him. I didn't see it. But he missed the turn. You got what I mean? So this bird turned. That bird sort of missed it, ran right into me. And the funny thing was, I had a GoPro camera above me, but it was so fast through the frame at an angle, it didn't, I mean, it's just a blur. It just goes right past it. It wasn't straight. It was that sideways. So the GoPro didn't help, unfortunately. I thought it was going to be a really good picture, but one of the other tips I can give you guys is master autofocus. Practice, practice, practice for birds in flight especially. It's not so easy. You want to be sitting continuous. You want to have a high frame rate. A um, lot of tips. On the pro bodies or the pro swimmer bodies, I recommend you set up on long, tracking sensitivity long, so it keeps on the subject longer before it drops. Hopefully it's not going over everybody's head, but... Um, also, I like using dynamic on Nikon or on, uh, on Canon. I think it'd be AFP if you expand to all the points and then you have it where it shows up. Nikon will actually show you the point. I like using that. So what I do is I lock in with the center and the camera will actually track the subject around. I like using that. The reason for that is, is I want to concentrate just on filling the frame with the subject, making sure it fits in there. I don't want to have to keep the point on the bird's head. You got what I mean? Because if you're using single point, you have to have the subject or where you want and focus in the center at all times. And I don't want to do that. Knowing your subject, very, very important. Probably the best, best tip I, one of the best tips I can give you is learn about your subjects. Learn about your subjects. <clears throat> I get the question a lot too is, you know, don't you feel bad? Don't, don't you feel bad that you bother the bears? Or do you think you have an effect on the bears? And, what we do is we're very conscious of that. So we're always trying to have the least amount of impact on the bears. We, we don't talk, we're quiet. We sit down low. And if, we're, if we follow all those rules, don't approach them, don't go directly towards them. You don't ever want to approach a bird directly. So we'll go up ahead of them and have them come to us. And what will happen if you're quiet, they'll actually just sit down and nurse. And when the bears are small, the baby bears are, are really small. Um, they call them spring cubs is their first... It's their first spring. Um, they'll nurse like every 20, 30 minutes, just constantly. So if you hang out with the bears for a while, they'll nurse right in front of you. It's a pretty amazing experience because they growl and they fight. I need to start shooting some of these things in video. It would be nice to have a video clip of that. But, uh, and you can see the milk on his chin and the milk on the nipple. Interesting. As I mentioned earlier, you, know, you learn about the bears and you see how they treat themselves differently in different situations. What happens is... 
usually the most common the most common number of bear cubs is usually three. And what will happen is as summer goes on, for whatever reason, they'll lose, unfortunately, lose a couple. And the dynamic of the family changes depending on how many cubs there still are. And if you know that, you can use it to your advantage. Because in this situation, it's a single, it's a single cub with a mother. And the mother was really tired from, from taking care of this youngster. She was really hot. It was about, I think it was in the high 60s. For the bears, that's like sweltering hot. And the bear sits down on the grass just to rest. And the baby looks over and says, oh, mom's laying down, time to play. And she just made a beeline right for the mother, jumped on top of the mother, they started playing. Um, it's amazing, though, they won't do this if it's, let's say, two or three cubs. They don't do that. But when and it gets down to one cub, the mother will spend all the time with a single cub. And they'll just play and play and play all the time. It's interesting to see that. This is not a honeybee. It might look like a honeybee, but a honeybee has a lot shorter. This is a longhorn bee. This is actually a California native. And uh, it's interesting. <clears throat> I, like the, I like the native bees a lot more. The, the honey bees are actually European native. They're not from, naturally from California. I try and study, study the bees. I like to photograph them. <clears throat> the nice thing about these guys is they actually don't, they don't live in a hive. They actually dig little tunnels. So they live in colonies, like loose, loose colonies. But they don't spend time together, really, only at flowers. But what the, so what it will do at nighttime, a lot of times, they won't go back to their burrow. They'll just go either inside a flower or under a flower, and they'll just lock on with their mandibles, and they'll just stay overnight. So if you know that, and you go in the morning when it's cool, a lot of times you'll find a flower with four or five bees sleeping inside it. It's a great photo because they don't fly. They just sit there and pose, so it's really nice. But honeybees will never do that. Honeybees are gone back to the hive. Oh, this is a lubber grasshopper. We actually don't have these in California. They only go to Arizona, I think. But, but um, it's actually shedding its skin. And if you know what to look out for, you can see them doing that. They, what they do is they leave the group, and they'll go up on top of a little perch, and they'll, they'll sit there motionless for a while. And I knew that because I went up and I poked him. He didn't move. I said, well, hey, I think he's going to shed his skin. Sure enough, within five minutes, he dropped down. And it's an interesting picture. And that's his old skin on top. You can see the black skin his old shell, exoskeleton. And it's interesting, if you look at the photo full size, he's hanging on by one toe. It's interesting. Not really a toe, but you know what I mean. If you don't know your subject and you want to go shoot photos, you can hire somebody like myself or a guide up there. Um, you don't... I like showing this picture because it proves to people that you don't always have to have the latest and greatest big, expensive, giant telephoto lens. If you're in the right place and you know what to do in situations, this is made with an LX3. It's a 2470 point and shoot camera, about that big. It's a Panasonic. And uh, I decided to show the group what you can do with a small little camera. You don't have to have a giant lens, like I said. So got the lens, put it in my pocket and my jacket, and I slid over to the, not looking at the eagles, I just slid over to the eagles really slowly in the snow. Got over next to them, did a test shot, and then slowly brought the camera up without looking at them. And then last second, looked at him and got a picture. One of them flew away after, but that's at 24 millimeter. Can you believe that? With a point-and-shoot camera. Interesting. I don't know if anybody shot, e photographed eagles here before? In California, they're really skittish. I mean, you can't get like 100 yards and they're off. Some places, they're very, very skittish. Here in Alaska, in the, where the photo was taken, you're really lucky because they're, they're habituated to people from the fishermen. So they're used to having people around, and they know that people mean food. So a lot of times we'll, we'll come down to an area and we'll get out of our car and start setting up and the eagles are already coming down, landing on the beach, waiting to see what we're going to do because they know humans mean food. It's good for photographers. It's not really the right way to do things, but it's good for photographers. Um, in this picture, it's not fake. They're not like wired down or glued down or anything and they're not stuffed. They're actually real birds. They're young eagles. How I did this picture was we scattered this perch out Waited for the high tide. It's at 3 o'clock. We went there at 2.55. Didn't wait for the high tide. Pulled up. The perch is on dry, dry ground. But as the water's coming up, guess what? There's less and less dry ground. So the eagles jumped on. And then right when I took this picture, I was only able to get two or three frames. Like five more eagles came in and landed and ruined the picture. But I was able to get this couple frames out of it. And you can see what's important is all the eagles are turned towards the camera a little bit. See that? They're not turned away. It sort of ruins a photo when the bird turns away. So, And 
you know, sharp-eyed, especially the bird photographers or sharp-eyed birds will see, they're actually all different ages. You see that? They're all young. They're all young birds. But, you know, the one on top the, the, is the oldest, the one on the right, and then the one on the left, that's a first-year bird. That bird's like six months old. Believe that. <laughs> so over the last years, we've seen some pretty amazing things up in Alaska. Now the bears are actually shooting the photographers. <laughs> and then this... This, the next picture is actually from this summer. We actually saw a sighting of the prehistoric giant salmon. No, really what this is, is, is sometimes in Alaska we get bad weather, so you're stuck on a boat for a couple days. You can't go out. It's pouring rain, so you, get, you want something to, t- to spend your time on, so you start doing things like this. <laughs> Knowing your subject is probably the best advice I can give you to, for the bird photographers here is. Uh, this is a bee eater, European bee eater. And the trick with this is, is you find out where their breeding colony is. You find a nice, beautiful perch with lichen. You don't find a perch that's been, been run over on the road, side of the road for a month, all dried out. You find a nice lichen-covered perch. You stick that in the dirt above their colony, and a bird will come right down and land on it because you just gave them prime real estate. Just come right down. So you set up a hide, you put a nice stick out, and they come down. And that's what they want. So he wants a perch to entice a female to come sit on his perch to try and invite her into his little tunnel, and they're going to form a partnership. <laughs> and his job is to keep her, to fatten her up to, to, to mate for the mating season. And he'll bring her. It's amazing. I've sat in the hide from morning till afternoon till almost evening, and you cannot believe. Every, let's say, every three minutes, he brings an insect. And they only catch... Food, they glean, they glean their food. Which, I'm sorry, they don't glean their food, which means off of a land, landed insect. They only catch in the air. So you'll be sitting, shooting the bird. The bird will take off. You'll look. You'll see a dragonfly. He'll come up and just go, choosh, and then come and land right on your perch right in front of you. It's just amazing. The funny thing is, though, is the females are very intelligent. They're very picky. And we've seen, we've sat in this blind with whoever I'm with. It's just the funniest thing is the male will come down with this little, like a, like a crane fly, you know, like a little spindly, little thin fly. Like a, it's, it's, like a, it's like a really large, almost like a daddy long legs, kind of a little insect. And they'll bring it up and they'll hand it to the female and she'll take it. And I guess because of the weight, she'll just drop it. They won't, they won't take, they only take the real fat insects. It's pretty amazing. So his chances of enticing her to be a mate directly correlate to how, how fat the insects are that she brings. <laughs> really interesting. This is taken uh, in New Mexico, sort of. Sort of our neighbor, almost. Um, that's a, how many people have been to Bosque? Anybody here? Okay. Yeah, it's one of the premier spots in Southwest for birds. They have uh, cranes, geese. I do tours there every, every winter. One of the most amazing places for color you'll ever see during the storm. And usually what you're doing in a place like this, actually the same applies to California, of course, is you're looking for some kind of weather. You know, a clear sky day like today is really the worst time to go out and photograph because the color washes out, you have real dark shadows, you have real bright highlights. The, 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 more, the worse the weather, I should say, the better it is for photography. This is a morning where it was like five degrees. So what that is is that steam, steam coming off the water, the air is so cold. It just rises up out, it comes up and billows out. And what I did was we were able to position ourselves. It's really knowing the spot and knowing the subjects. And we got the light hit from behind, the, the morning light, so it turns like it's fire. Really interesting against the black background. And then again, there again, I'm using a dynamic autofocus, so I'm, I lock on the bird in the center, and I pan, and I can actually put the bird back in the frame, and the autofocus will track the bird back in the frame. Shutter speed's probably uh, the biggest tip I can give you. You need to use the proper shutter speed in your photos. So for action... For action, you want to be at least 1250 or higher. So let's say I'm going to go out to the day to go shoot some action, and I'm going to go to the beach and shoot waves or surfing or whatever. I'm going to put my shutter speed at 1250 minimum and go above that. Sometimes I'll do a show somewhere, and I'll talk about a certain lens, like the 50 to 500. And I'll get an email like a month later, and the person says, hey, I really like what you said about that lens. It sounded really interesting, so I went out and bought one. But I have to say, my pictures aren't as sharp as yours. Is my lens broken or is it me? And I said, I don't know, send me a picture. 
And the guy will send me a picture. And so you can imagine he's shooting with a 500 millimeter lens, hand holding it. And I get the picture, hand holding or not, really even. And I get the picture, and I look at the EXIF data. It's the tag, it's the information that's tagged onto the, onto the picture that shows you the settings of the camera. And this guy was shooting like, I don't know, a two hundredth of a second. So he's shooting a 500 millimeter lens of action at two hundredth of a second. That, you can see where that's gonna lead to problems, right? Um, so the number one thing I can tell you is, if you're gonna shoot wildlife, any kind of action, you wanna be at least 1250 or higher. That's directly gonna correlate to sharper images, let me tell you. Now, 1250 or higher for, for sharp photos, but a lot of times what I like to do is if we get really bad light, like up in Alaska, you get these big storms that come through all the time. I mean, every other day it seems like you get big storms that come through and the light level drops really low. So instead of me shooting at 1250 of a second shutter speed at 25 million ISO, what I'll do is I'll just drop the ISO down to 200 and I'll start to do pan blurs, action blurs. That's at about 20th of a second. What makes the photo successful for me is, and what makes it uh, much more successful than if I was to shoot stop action is, is you can't tell in the photo, but this was a really choppy day. So the water, this is over water, and the water is just waves every direction. It's, it's horrible, sloppy, bad weather. But when you pan, those waves create beautiful brush strokes across the frame. So if you guys haven't, you want to try and do blurs. But just like I have a requirement in my mind, I have a number of where I try and do my action photos, I also have a number that I recommend to do blur. So what you want to do is about a 60th of a second and down. Don't do 125 or 200. That's in the middle. It's like no man's land. If the bird's perched, you can shoot whatever you want. But if the bird's flying around, um, you, want to go, you want to go below a 60th. This is a 20th. But you have to realize also, though, that as you go slower, the images get more and more interesting and more artistic. But guess what? Your keeper rate goes off the cliff. So <laughs> I've actually shot a second blurs, a second, a full second. But if you're going to do a second blurs, you're going to get one frame decent out of 300. But if you shoot it at 60, you probably get about five good ones maybe. <clears throat> Depends. Here's a combination of sharp and blur. So the birds are roosting. And right in the middle of the long exposure, the birds took off. You can see the, the wing beats at the top. Here's a 20th of a second, but I'm using flash. And you can see the sharp wings, the sharp wing tips there. That's from the flash. The sharp head's from the flash. Part of the legs are from the flash. The background is from the ambient exposure blurred. So you have two exposures in one. You have a sharp flash exposure, and you have a soft, a soft blur exposure in the background from, from the shutter of the camera. I love doing blurs, if you can't tell. That's a quarter second with a 500 millimeter lens. That's actually a flock of birds taking off. And I didn't go crazy with a paintbrush in the background putting color. That's actually, those are cottonwood trees. The purple is actually the haze. It's the haze you get on the mountains. I'm getting even crazier. That's a, that's a second blur. And it's funny, you can see a little bit on the right side there how the one bird goes off the opposite direction and then notices the flock's going the opposite direction and says, oh, wait a minute, hey, go back, turn back the other way. And you can see them direct back up. And, and if you look at this, the blurs of each bird, you can count their wing beats. I think it's like seven beats a second. Interesting. And this actually isn't what you'd call a pan blur. This is tilting up and at an angle. I'm just following the birds up. So it's more of like a tilt blur, I guess you could say. I love doing close-ups, one of my passions. I love it. I like it because you don't need a lot of huge, heavy equipment. You can make use just with a small macro lens and a flash, maybe. When you think of close-ups, don't just think of insects and flowers. You can do anything. You can do humans. You can do eyeballs, anything. Birds, talons here, in this case. You don't have to use macro lens or close-up lens. This is a 500 millimeter lens with a 1.5 crop body with a 1.7 converter. So it's like 1,200 millimeters, something like that. And that's one of the birds from the last series there that's a bee eater. Probably the same day, actually, one of the same days. And that's big dragonfly. But I just love going out to botanical gardens and shooting and shooting and shooting. One of my favorite things about macro is, is you're in control of everything. You know, wildlife photography, 
Um, you really have to plan ahead. You have to bring a lot of big, heavy, expensive equipment. You need to travel very far. Unfortunately, there's not so much wildlife stuff in California. There is on the coast, closer to the coast, but not like Alaska or Africa. So you need to make, schedule these long trips years in advance, a year in advance maybe, um, very complicated. And you end up, guess what? Once you get there, you make preparations a year ahead and you get up there and guess what? You wait. So you wait and you wait and you wait. Sometimes we'll wait a week for the fish to run up the river. You have thousands of fish in the bay, thousands, 10,000 fish in the bay. You have 20 hungry bears and the, the fish are waiting for something. They're waiting for the tide to push up or they're waiting for more fresh water to come out of the stream. They're waiting and waiting. So sometimes you wait. Landscape photography is worse. Landscape photography, you know, you schedule two years in advance. You go to this spot for two weeks. You go scout it. And then you get all your equipment there and you're waiting, and guess what? For 15 minutes of perfect light. But macro photography or close-up photography, we can go right now and make good, nice photos because you can use a diffuser to cut the sun, that brightens the sun. You can use a flash. You can use reflectors. You know. So basically with macro, you're in charge of everything. But my favorite thing, like I mentioned before, is all my macro equipment fits in a little backpack. When I do wildlife photography or landscape, you have a giant case full of really expensive equipment. Um, macro, you can do more on a budget. You can probably do macro with what you already have, probably. Cases are. I like using flash. This is a flash image. People say, you know, while the color is so bright in all your images, you must use a lot of saturation or you must really do a lot of work with the color. And actually, I really don't. But the flash is what gives me the clean colors. Because flash is a really warm, it's not a cold light, it's a really warm light. So the, the colors really pop with flash. Really good clean light. Also with macro, as I mentioned, you want to follow the same guidelines as wildlife photography. You want to get down low. And this is a good case where I'm not shooting into the flower from the top. I'm down low at the angle of the bee. A little more interesting, right, than just a straight down photo. Flash would have been in, made this picture possible. This would have been impossible without flash because this, this butterfly is actually under a bush. It's in the shade, but the background's in sun. So in order to expose for the, the uh, butterfly, I would have had to have used a reflector, which still wouldn't, might not have been possible, but I use flash. If I would have not had the flash, I would have had to have overexposed the subject by, what, one and two-thirds or two stops. What would have happened to the background? would have been completely washed out. But flash on it like an eighth of a set, eighth power, just pop, lit the subject up perfectly. And actually the main thing of flashes too is you can't really tell up there too much, but um, it gives you razor sharp detail. Flash really brings out nice detail. That's an example of my, of my flash setup, just a one single wireless flash triggered by the pop-up flash on the camera. And if you want to see what kind of detail you can get, just with a handheld macro lens with a single flash. I mean, not very expensive, not very complicated, pretty simple, really. That's, I think it's a calendrina. Calendrina, it's a little, small, little pink flower, like that big. That's full frame. And so I'll show you the detail zoomed in 100%. That's the detail. So you can see every grain of pollen with just handheld, just with a macro lens, a Sigma macro. Same thing again. Looking down into, uh, I think it's an African, I forgot what the name of the flower is, but looking down into the flower and then zooming in close, it's almost like an abstract, that's the detail. You basically can't get, you can't really get any more detail than that. I don't see how. It's, it's pretty amazing what you can do. Now it's more of an abstract, but it's still interesting also. So one of the things you want to do is, uh, how I came about this picture was, you want to, easy thing to do is, in your mind, either in the camera, in the field, or after the fact, split it into quads, just a tip. Or you can use rule of thirds, but quads are, are great. Just stick the subject into one of the quads. You want to just get it out of the center. Um, professional people call that center point-itis. When people get a new camera, they center every single picture. Every single picture they shoot out of 500 pictures has a subject dead in the center. What happens is a static composition. There's do, it's not dynamic, it's not unbalanced. So you look at it and it's just, okay, well, nice picture. But you want to try and get it more of a dynamic composition so quads really help. Or rule of thirds. But that's a little bit harder for people to do, especially in the field. Um, 
Background, super important. You want to have a nice, smooth background. You want to also think in terms of color contrast, not just contrast in black and white, lights and darks. But you also want to try and use color contrast. So get a complementary color or, or a color like this to bring out the green, make them stand out. If you're going to shoot insect photos, here's dragonflies, make sure or try to do whatever you can not to shoot the subjects on dead sticks. You want to try and use something live. Consider the, consider the perch as important as a subject, okay? Don't just shoot things on dead sticks. If you come across a dragonfly on a little pond and he's landing in the dead stick, bring a piece of tape and get something live and tape it to the dead stick and they'll land right back on the live thing you put on top of there if you want, if, they, if you can. Um, they don't discriminate. So, but just don't shoot birds or insects on dead sticks, please. Here's a couple different uh, pictures here to show you the, the differences with the different lenses. On the left is a 180 macro, and the middle is a 150 macro. On the right, a 50 macro. And the reason I show this is people actually ask me all the time, you know, how do you get such soft backgrounds? Well, using a longer lens will magnify the background because it has a smaller angle of view. So it's really easy to get soft backgrounds like on the left there versus a 50 millimeter on the right. One of the other ways, it, one of the other reasons I like using the longer lenses too is not just the soft background, but if there was a beer can behind this orchid, let's just say, in the photo, with a 50, you'd have to move really far to get the beer can out because of the wide angle of view. With a 180, if you have a beer can in the background, you just move the lens like one inch, the beer can's gone. So it's much easier to clean the background up because you're, looking, you're using a really very small angle of view. Unfortunately, the longer lenses are more expensive and heavier. But So you want to find a compromise in there somewhere. Anybody guess what that is? It's a wing scale, butterfly wing scale. That's the same wing. That's a dot on the... That's actually at, uh, I think, 25x. 25 times life size. It's actually 2.5 microns across. That is 10x. That's 10 times life size. They look like metallic, metallic shingles, but that's actually just a butterfly wing. Interesting. When I lead my tours and I do my workshops, I, uh, I tell people, you know, wear long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes, boots maybe even. Tie the, tie the cuffs, and that's to protect you from the sun, from insects, from everything. But I don't always listen to myself, so I actually went out one day wearing shorts and flip-flops, went out doing photographs. And uh, so I got bit by an ant pretty quickly. But once he bit and stung me, I wiped him off. I actually killed it. So he donated his body to science, so I took the ant home and shot pictures. So that's the ant's head. I believe that's 10x. And that's a close-up of the detail. I use what's called stacking software. I use Zerine, and I also use Helicon Focus. So what you're able to do is you're able to take slices. So for that ant head, I took, I think it was about 80 pictures. You take 80 slices, and the software blends them together. Because that's the depth of field that you're dealing with at, ten, at uh, 10x. It's very, 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 you're talking tenths of a millimeter. Um, and the problem with something like that is the more you stop down, the more sharpness you lose due to diffraction. So you basically have to shoot wide open all the time. So hopefully, maybe next year I can talk to the management. Maybe we can do some kind of field workshop uh, here somewhere in springtime. And I can bring some of the lenses I've used for these photos, and everybody can even try, try some of this stuff. Um, about a month ago, two months ago, I actually made the cover of Bloomberg with one of my eagle photos. It's interesting only because it shows you, I can show you here how they came about finding the photo. It's interesting and how they chose the photo and how they changed it. But they actually asked me. They turned it to black and white and they changed the background. They wanted to make it more foreboding, more, more evil, I guess you can say. But pretty interesting. Bloomberg is my biggest cover. They actually had a, they have a million, a million issues a week in circulation. So... Special thanks to Sigma for making this possible. Like I said, they make it possible for me to be here. They pay my way here. 
So give, give them a look. They have a, they actually have a booth here up in the auditorium over there. And I think they have a promotion that if you buy a lens, not here, but if you buy a lens today with Sammy's camera over there, they actually will give you a free polarizing filter. It's kind of like a nice little incentive. And also thanks to lens coat. And here's my information. If you have any questions or you didn't understand something or you have a, need some advice or if you want to take a workshop or a tour, and I actually have a sheet of paper. You can leave me your email. I have a newsletter I do every month for free. You can sign up for my, my email or send me an email and just say, hey, can I have your newsletter? I do tips and things, news. <laughs>